Our next presenter is Jordan Williams. Jordan is an environmental studies major pursuing honors and will graduate this quarter. Yay! After graduation, Jordan is dedicating herself to service and joining the Peace Corps. Let's give it up. It's clearly riding the field train. How emotional it feels to your climate center votership. That makes much more sense. Yeah. So much. yeah. Jordan's host organization is Seattle Subway Foundation. Her site supervisor there is Eugene Kramer, and her faculty advisor was Kate Ivers at, of the UW Atmospheric Sciences Department. Let's give it up for Jordan to start with our presentation. How does one convince a society to change their behavior? It's a big question, I know. Aristotle suggested that really the only way is to appeal to three sides of their mind, logos, ethos, and pathos. Now, if you haven't heard these words before, just know that logos is logical, think statistics, ethos is authoritative, think credibility, and pathos is emotional, something to tug on your heartstrings. When combined, these three techniques are powerful in their persuasion. And that persuasive ability is absolutely vital to harness if we are going to successfully convince entire societies to transition to sustainable practices. However, as environmental communicators, we do not always have the time or attention of the audience to elaborate on all three areas. This is when it becomes important to know the most efficient method for short form communication opportunities. So I ask the question, which of Aristotle's three primary rhetorical techniques, ethos, logos, or pathos, is most effective for persuasively conveying environmental information to the voting public? My position as a high school outreach intern for Seattle Subway Foundation gave me the opportunity to test this question with specifically future voters. So I've narrowed it just a little bit. The various presentations that I created to test this question relied on explaining the benefits of an expanded light rail in Seattle in areas like CO2 emissions, public health, and productivity. In order to create the different test groups to draw answers from, I presented three different versions of the same information to highlight either its statistical benefits, its human-based sentiments, or its distinguished origins. For example, I had to convey differently, just how much pollution comes from cars here in Seattle. I did so by explaining the exact amounts of CO2 emitted, some of the environmental justice aspects of that greenhouse gas, and the Department of Ecology's perspective on the issue. Then, with a simple survey regarding the importance of key voting issues like public rail transit that each student took before and after their presentation, I was able to gauge their interest in the issue that I brought up. Now, after doing, after converting the survey answers like neutral and extremely important into numerical values and doing some calculations, I came up with my metric of change in perceived importance. So with the help of my internship partner, Maddie Etter, we presented to and collected data from over 200 students at nine different schools in the Seattle area. And I ended up taking results from 143 usable survey responses. This histogram shows the culmination of that data with the y-axis showing the exact number of responses at each level of change. The left of the x-axis represents a decrease in perceived importance and the right is an increase. Zero is no change. You can see that ethos and logos have most common changes of response at zero. Pathos, however, has a most common change of response equal to one whole point. This next graph more simply shows the overall average change in perceived importance of public transit options in a society. You can see that pathos is significantly higher. Both of those graphs said basically the same thing. The pathos or human emotion-based presentations showed more real change in the audience than either ethos or logos. 
Now, while this research was conducted on the matter of the expanded light rail system in Seattle to youth audiences specifically, the concept should be applicable to any and all environmental communication from park restoration to aquaculture permitting. Catalyzing any major societal change is going to take complex and in-depth discussions involving all kinds of appeals from all kinds of people. However, as environmentalists, we must be ready to capitalize on any opportunity to nudge the public mind in the direction of sustainability. Since my research shows the best way to do this is through appeals to emotion and human connection, we've hopped on board the feels train. Are you going to join? Thank you. Thank you all so much for listening. A huge extra thanks to Dr. Kat Hybers from UW, Eugene Kramer from Seattle Subway, my internship partner, Maddie Etter, who has been so incredibly helpful to me this whole time. And lastly, to the teachers and high schoolers who took the time and attention out of their day to participate in the study. Thank you. All right, we have some questions for Jordan. Yes, right here. Emotional appeal to high schoolers that cause the most change. What? Okay, so the question was, what emotional appeals did I use that caused the high schoolers to have the most change? Um, emotional appeals ranged from anything to from like stories about individual humans to like I showed, focusing specifically on environmental justice rather than just the rates of CO two that we're emitting. Hope that answers. Great. Another question for Jordan. Yeah. Um, of the people we worked with, the high school students, uh, was it a pretty healthy mix of people who were under the voting age, or did we primarily focus on people who were like 17, 20, 18? Great question. Okay, so the question was, uh, who did we focus on? What ages for high schoolers did we focus on? We presented to anyone who would listen. We emailed everyone, and everyone who said yes, we presented to. Um, it ranged, it was pretty even. I did like factor it out by exact age group. And in case you're wondering, no age was more susceptible than any other age, but um, no, we did pretty much any high schoolers that we could get our hands on. Not sure that came that example. <laughs> yeah. Did the high schoolers you talked to all have an existing familiarity with the Leaflet system? Were they all in Seattle and in proximity to? So the question was, were all the high schoolers that we talked to within proximity and aware of the existing light rail system, right? Um, we didn't have one-on-one -on -one conversations, so I don't exactly know. Oh, the geography? Yeah, for the most part, people were pretty aware. Most of the community, all the high schools that we presented to were in the greater Seattle area. So it was within the reach of the Lane Viral System as well as Seattle School District. Um, they mostly knew about it from the questions we got asked. Uh, oh, one Last more, one. One more. Last question. Um, how do you feel that this method to like address climate change will work when like focusing in the age of all things that make you like my change? Ooh. <laughs> okay, how do I think this uh, this appeal will function in the age of climate change denial? I'm gonna say the same way all environmental communication does and has. Um, I know right now environmental communication and therefore its denial is a huge topic, but I wouldn't say we're necessarily any more climate deniers than we ever have been. Um, so for that, I would say, it's the best one out of ethos, logos, and pathos. <laughs> That's what I know. All right. Thank you. <laughs>